All right. Hey, Coach, how are you? Um, uh, thank you for joining us. You want to introduce yourself before we get started on QB play? I appreciate you having me. Uh, my name is Mitch Militello. I'm a GA and assistant quarterbacks coach at UCF. Um, originally from St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, went to the University of Missouri. Um, was a student coach there, GA with uh, Coach Heupel. Um, and when he came down to UCF, I came down with him. So I've been here for uh, a little over two years now. That's awesome. So I know you're going to talk some QB play and some, mm -hmm. and some mechanics and some of your drill tape, but do you have an overall philosophy of, of the position and what you believe in at the quarterback position? Yeah, I mean, for us, we're, we're a little bit different than a lot of people. Uh, obviously, we had a pretty special one in Drew Locke at Missouri. So anytime you can find a 6'4", you know, 215-pounder that can throw the ball anywhere around the field, that's, that's a great, great dude to have. But uh, down here at UCF, obviously, it's a little bit different. Um, started in 2018, we had Mackenzie Milton, who was a, uh, you know, a Heisman finalist and uh, player of the year in our conference. Right. And He's, you know, a touch over 5'10", you know, a touch shy of 5'11", somewhere in that range. And uh, so we, you know, we really started to kind of develop our understanding that there are specific pieces of playing this position that have nothing to do with height and weight. And obviously there's a piece of, you know, wanting to have enough arm talent and wanting to be big enough so that you can sustain a whole season. But the ability to create plays um, and, and do things off schedule is, has been a huge part for our uh, previous two years with our two different quarterbacks. I feel like you're starting to hear that life. more and more is, is being able to to be successful out of schedule. And, and no question. You know, I feel like that's a big part of the quarterback position. I definitely agree with you. Yeah, um, no doubt. That's been huge for us. If you want, we can get rolling on your tape and you, we can talk a little bit back and forth, have a little yeah. conversation on some ball. But if you want to share a screen and, and get rolling, Absolutely. you're welcome to. Yep. I'll uh, do that right now. All right. You got that? Yep. All good. Cool. We got you here. All right. So just getting started, I want to hit some general offensive philosophy stuff uh, for us. This is something that um, I mean, pretty much in any you know clinic that has to do with with UCF and with any of our offensive coaches, they'll talk at least a little bit about these principles, because uh, this is I mean, the, these principles are a big, big piece of what we do offensively. So. Uh, just the five things that we want to always uh, have at the top of our mind is personnel placement tempo, spacing, vertical run game, and vertical pass game. And what you'll see there is that tempo is actually number two. And uh, that's a lot of times that's what people think of first when they think of UCF football is just how fast we go. And while it is a big part of what we do, we have to first think about where we're putting our people and are we putting our people in the right position to succeed. So getting into that piece of it, all right, for us it's asking your guys what they can do, right? Um, which is easy to say and hard to do. A lot of coaches talk about that all the time, right? That they want to put their people in the right position. Uh, and, and not a lot of times do they actually do it. Um, guys, uh, a great story that Coach Levy, who's the uh, offense coordinator at uh, Ole Miss now, who was our offense co coordinator the past couple of years, is back when he was at Baylor, they uh, had a guy that, you know, was dropping the ball across the middle all the time. And he was a freaky, fast, small guy that was just dropping the ball and they wanted to call him soft and soft and couldn't catch, couldn't play uh, before somebody in the room just said, hey, why don't we just send him down, down the damn field? And he basically only ran verticals after that. And uh, I, he was almost the, the team leader in receptions. And uh, I'm pretty sure he was the team leader in yards uh, one of those years. So um, easy to say, hard to do. You have to commit to it and, and understand that as much as you want to call a guy soft or you know, wants them to fit your mold for a position, you got to fit it to them. Um, and then the next part of it is putting our best on their worst. We find ways creatively to get our outside receivers on the inside, get our inside guys outside, uh, put our running backs out in space. Uh, that's, that's a big part of our creativity is it, it's not creative for the sake of creativity. It's creative for the sake of our players being on their worst players. Um, so, Coach, could you go back real quick to the tempo? Yep. I was yep. going to ask – what do you guys believe in tempo wise? Are you guys, uh, do you guys change tempos quite a bit? Do you guys go fast? What do you guys believe in there? We're all, all speed all the time. Okay. So um, there are times in third down where the quarterback can kind of slow it down to understand his protection a little bit better. And, and then down in the red zone, uh, we're, we slow down a little bit, but for the most part, we're all speed all the time. And uh, we're uh, one of the couple fastest teams in the country. Right. Okay. Yep. So, that's obviously the next part of it is a huge piece of what we do too. 
All right, so going fast all the time, right? You don't get to start the drive fast. They don't give you the ball and, and let you snap it with the defense not ready. All right, so getting the first first down is uh, absolutely crucial for us, right? It's there's a study, self scout study that I do that um, that I don't have on here right now, but that we we study what the first first down means to us, and and it means a lot uh, because it allows us to get our tempo going. So those first two three plays that that we get to get that first first down are crucial for us. Um, tempo means more snaps. That means more opportunities to score. Simple as it gets, right? Uh, it allows us to dictate the flow of the game, and more importantly, it allows us to be the aggressor. So we don't let the defense sit back. A lot of the time, we'll see that defenses will change a little bit for us because they need to be creative uh, in, in their game plan. But during the middle of the game, they, they're not able to change a whole lot. And during the middle of the drive, they're not able to change a whole lot. So it allows us to be the aggressor all the time. Uh, it creates tired and unsound defense and allows us to steal yards. So that's to us, that's what the verbalization of what tempo actually means to us. Okay, so this is uh, what allows us to actually play fast, okay? So this is what we call ball mechanics, all right? So it essentially is the way that our guys operate from, the, from after the uh, ball is dead to the snap of the next ball, okay? So wherever they get the ball from, right? So it doesn't matter where the receiver is, their job is to get the ball to the umpire, okay? So just reading down through the, the positional piece of it, the center's job right after the, the ball is dead is to find the line judge, the LJ's on the sides there, and then where the hash and the line judge intersect, set your feet. Okay, the outside receivers, they align off of the tackle's foot, so they won't even have to look at the ball. The slots hug the line of scrimmage as close as possible. The running backs and quarterbacks, Depending on where they get tackled, they can give the ball to either the center judge, who's the guy that spots it, or the umpire. And then the receivers, right? It says tackled inbounds or tackled out of bounds. The majority of the time, their job is to get back in bounds and give the ball to the umpire. Uh, at the bottom there, the fastest way to get the ball set is to get the ball inside, be decisive, and ensure the ball is in the official's hands, no long throws. So we still let them throw the ball, but we don't let them chuck it from all the way into the right. sideline to the middle of the field. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, so it – I mean, I've got some clips of this before I get to the rest of the stuff. I mean, this is a huge part of what we do because it allows us to get the ball set and uh, and create those tired and unsound defenses and steal yards like we talked about before. So just some tape of us actually doing it. Right. Ball gets completed, stays in bounds there. Right. He freaks out, whatnot. He sends it to the outside official. Okay, so what will end up happening is when he sends it to the outside official, he most of the time, right, will set the ball at his feet. The next official will get a ball in from the sideline and then they'll have to throw it all the way in. Right. So that's three or four more steps, whereas 17, who caught the ball there and did that, he could have easily just ran it in and taken probably five, 10, maybe even 15 seconds off of our uh, time in between snaps. So starting off there, not a great look of what it is. And it seems so simple. I mean, teams that go fast, like this is a way uh, – seconds are everything, and this is a way for us to shave off seconds. Damn, so, I didn't think about any of that. that that's good stuff. So it, it, the detail in between the, the snaps is so big for us because, you know, you, you can commit to playing fast and you can play really fast, but, I mean, we, we try to think about every little detail of it. So running back right here bounces outside, right, gets tackled near the sideline, same thing, right? And then here you can see what the receiver does or what the uh, umpire or the line judge does, right? He's not the one sending it in. He's, he sets it at his feet, right? And it's going to take extra time off, right? I think this one is one of the good ones. So before, obviously, I'm trying to skip ahead to the good ones here, but this is – we put the bad ones on here because this is a presentation that we give to our team uh, twice a year. We give it to them at the beginning of spring ball and we give it to them at the end uh, of uh, at the beginning of fall camp as well. Okay, so right here, throwing the ball across the middle of the tight end. All right, he goes down, pops right back up and gives the ball to the umpire. Okay, you see how quick that transaction is right there, right? He doesn't put the ball on the ground. He doesn't do anything. He just pops up, gives the ball to the official. And then you can see his eyes, right? His eyes are going right back to the sideline and to me as a signaler. Right. So that's huge, huge. That's a great job by a veteran guy right there. OK. And what you'll see is on the very next play. 
Let's get through these views here. Uh, we didn't get the next play, but on the next play, it was a big one. All right. Here was uh, Pittsburgh. All right. Ball gets tossed outside. All right. He's on the sideline. He pump fakes it <laughs> to the line judge, remembers that he's not supposed to be doing that and brings the ball back inside. So you can see that it's ingrained in our guys. And I'll take that a step further. Skip to the end here. Let's see, uh, so this this year we had a uh, transfer quarterback, right? Brandon Wimbush from from Notre Dame, right? And you could see how quickly it was ingrained into him that he couldn't give the ball to the line judge. Okay, so he gets tackled out of bounds here. All right, he tosses it to the line judge. All right, he messes up. Well, <laughs> you can see right there as he was trying to fight him. <laughs> that's awesome. The ball back. So that's, I mean, that's huge for our guys to be able to see that he knew that he messed it up. He had to go get the damn ball back so that we could get it inside and play as fast as we possibly could. I mean, dude, so, it, it really saves you guys a ton of time if you really think about it over the course of a game. It's it's huge for us. And and that's something that, um, you know, me and Coach Heupel, when we were back at Missouri, we uh, looked into uh, where all the officials were, where right? we sat down with an official, pointed out where each one of them is, and put it on that um, that PowerPoint, right, of where each official is and then where we go with the ball after that play is done, right? And then one thing, this is still from Missouri right here, but the, the arrow right here uh, pointing at the, the side judge in the back, right, that's actually something that we've gone even further and we decided to bring it back in, obviously, off of those clips when, uh, when, you, when the ball is out of bounds, so. Uh, that's a huge way for us to play fast, and uh, and that's that's something that the details obviously are, are a big deal for us in that. Okay, uh, the last few things, right? Just want to go through quickly. Spacing is obviously huge. If you watch any of our games, you can see our receivers are spread way out, right? For us, it's you know we got a full 53 and third. We might as well use it, right? And and there's a bunch of different ways to use it. And I think, uh, you know, one thing you see if you watch the national championship and, and LSU got into a bunch of bunch formations, tight, tight split formations at the beginning of the game and Venables decided to heat them up. And, you know, for the quarterback, it's, it was hard for me to watch because, you know, for a Heisman winning quarterback, he didn't get a view of where anybody was coming from, right? right. If all 22 bodies are within the hash, right? It's really difficult to understand where all the defensive bodies are coming from. So. What really helped them out was spreading out towards the end of the game, and obviously they were able to take off and win the thing. So for us, that's what we do all the time, right? We want to stress conflict players in, in the run-pass game, right? We want to have defined fixtures for the quarterback. We want to make people defend everything, right? And then obviously it creates one-on-ones in the pass game too. Okay, uh, vertical run game, all right? Limits negatives. So vertical run game to me before I get into any of this stuff is we have to dent the line of scrimmage first. That means everything is forward first. So what you'll see is, um, I mean, 80% of our run game is all inside run game between the tackles. Now what, what you'll also see is because it starts vertical and Denton the uh, line of scrimmage first, we'll get a lot of bounce out cuts too. So it won't always be an inside the tackles run. Right. We'll, get a lot of bounce, we'll get a lot of bounces because teams want to stop us from uh, running in between the tackles. So it plays off of our spacing. When it hits, it's gone, right? And then – in short yardage situations, we don't have to worry about, you know, being able to dent the line of scrimmage because we do it all the damn time. So big for us. And then the last piece is the vertical pass game, right? Plays off the vertical run game, right? Makes you the aggressor, like we talked about with the tempo, puts pressure on the defense. And then my favorite saying, can't score if you don't try. Hmm. Might as well chuck it. Right. So we, uh, we throw, no doubt, we, we throw the ball all over the field and we let our guys go play. So that's a big piece of who we are. and. Um, you know, like I said, any, any clinic you see with, with any of our offensive coaches, those principles are going to be shared in, in any of it because it's a huge part of what we do. Well, getting into that, let's talk a little, a little QB play. Um, you want to go over yep. some of your, uh, some of your ND, just some of your fundamentals and kind of what you believe in, in the QB position. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay. Just put a couple slides together for this. Um, just through some of the stuff that we, we talk about. Um, okay. So. For us, it starts with ground zero, all right? And uh, this is something that, um, you know, I when I first started as a coach, I was in, it was in 2015 uh, at Missouri, and then Coach Heupel got there in 2016. And uh, one of the first things that we talked about was ground zero, okay? So 
ground zero, as simple as it sounds, all right, is before you teach a quarterback how to play, you have to teach him how to stand. And that sounds so bizarre because anytime you get a new quarterback, you want to teach him all the ins and outs of the offense. You know, you want to get him throwing the ball, doing all this stuff. But for us, you have to teach him how to stand the right way. Okay, so toes, knees, and hips all in alignment, right? So that means that you're you're toe to toe, right? You're not staggered in your feet. Like we want to be here instead of it's kind of hard to see, but we don't want to be staggered like this. And a lot of teams still use the three step drop for good reason. It's I mean pretty clean. We don't use it uh, because not a lot of stuff we do is timing based, progression based. But what you'll see is you know I, I can't stand up here, but teams that cross their foot over, right? Anytime they stand now, their back foot will be back behind their front foot. So you're in that weird staggered position where yeah, you have to take your step. Yeah, you have to take that right step up to be able to deliver the ball. So just like we talked about with ball mechanics in our offense, all these little things are shaving off, I mean, even milliseconds for quarterbacks right. for us to be able to get the ball out and get the ball out clean. Okay. Uh, for us, cleats in the ground, weight on the insteps, not in your toes. We're not up on our toes. We're not hot feet. We're not getting our feet up and down all the time because – at, a, at its base level, I mean, we, we want our guys to be relaxed back there, and we want our guys to be in a clean and efficient uh, place. And what, our, what I tell our quarterbacks all the time, our loose muscles are quick muscles. We don't want your muscles to be all tense all over your body. We want you to be loose. We want you to be able to get the ball out pretty quick. So standing tall with a slight knee bend, playing as tall as you are. And then the goal of every drop and movement that we move into after this is to get back to that position, that ground zero position. So it, it has to start there before we get into all the drops and movements because we want them to be able to get back to that. If you start the opposite way, it's pretty hard to get to them to that ground zero position. Okay. And then moving into that stuff with our techniques and our fundamentals, right? It's about having the least amount of wasted movement, right? Distinct movements done quickly. So our job is to identify the movements that are important, make them a habit, and then start to speed them up. Right. It's not to do everything game like immediately. Right. And spring ball and fall camp, a big thing for us is to be able to identify the movements and make them a habit before we start actually speeding them. Um, the game. So this is something that a lot of quarterbacks and quarterback coaches over a long period of time, they do the exact opposite. And I'm not here to say that, you know, one way is right, one way is wrong. But this is the way that, that we do it and we believe in is the game's never played more than an inch off the ground. So. You know, a big thing that Coach Eiffel believes in is we don't do any uh, bag drills. We don't have them jumping over bags. We don't have them moving anything where they have to take their, their feet over an inch off the ground. So for us, it's if you can stay as low to the ground as possible and your drops and your movements, and then you're going to be able to get the ball out quick. Okay. And then this is a huge part uh, is, is always chasing sustain, sustained success. Jeez, sorry. So sustained success. All right. So QBs can throw good balls with bad fundamentals and vice versa. So what QBs will say, especially young QBs that have a little bit of an attitude, as they all do, is they'll get in, they'll throw some good balls, and we'll try to tweak something, and they'll just want to stick with what they're doing because they're throwing good balls. But the idea is we want to be chasing sustained success, which means that if, if you're doing something that you're completing balls on, you might come back the next day, and it might not be a repeatable delivery. You might have your feet all over the place. I mean, it. So our guys are always chasing sustained success, sustained accuracy, okay? And then for us, nothing I've talked about so far has anything to do with the throwing arm, okay? So the non-negotiables for us is all body position, balance, movement, staying close to the ground, all of that, right? So you see the name Willie McGee down there, right? This is a story that my dad used to tell me all the time and, and still tells me all the time is he was a uh, Cardinals Hall of Fame baseball player, right? So I'm from the city of St. Louis. So he was in the Yankees farm system for a long time, had a funky swing, uh, and they tried to fit him into the Yankee mold and couldn't do anything with him, kind of busted out of the Yankee system. Came over to the Cardinals. They tried to tweak him a little bit. Still didn't work. So a uh, minor league hitting coach basically didn't do anything with his swing, just told him to go out there and do it. Fixed a couple things with his balance, fixed a couple things with his eyes and what he was expecting, but just kind of let him go out there and let his swing be a swing, and he became a Cardinals Hall of Famer. So – for us, it's the exact same thing. We don't want to mess with your arm too much. There might be a little little things in where you hold the ball or how you grip the ball, but everything else, the non-negotiables, are all with your feet, balance, and body position. So that's something that's huge that we believe in because, you know, by the time kids are 18 years old and coming to college, their their stroke is their stroke. Like they're going to be, you know, throwing the ball with their arm pretty much, you know, the same way no matter what. Right. So 
You yeah, can it's like when they, get to that, when they get to that point, I mean, it's hard to, to get that habit out of them because they've done it for 18 years of their life. So. No question. And that's, and that's such a, um, it's a muscle memory thing, you know, for, for your arm. So it, it, all we want to do is kind of tweak, you know, how you hold the ball, you know. And if, if, te- if guys have a huge loop in their delivery, there's ways that we can shorten that up. But for the most part, we just let their arm be their arm. Yep. So I agree with that's that. That's a that's a big piece for us. Um, and then I've got some some video of our, our quarterback. If you want to watch that. Yep. Definitely. Cool. All right. So this is actually from uh, this Monday. This is Dylan Gabriel uh, out in Hawaii. This is our start quarterback from last year. Um, he sent it to me, and we're actually going to hop on uh, later on this afternoon and watch it to get keep talking about mechanics a little bit. Um, so first off, I want to point out the fact that he's got a bucket hat underneath a hoodie. So, I was wondering what the hell is, that was. The kid is absolutely bizarre. I love him to death, but he is bizarre. So he, uh, okay, here he is. I'm going to turn the volume I love the uh, tucked in sweats to the socks. Uh, yeah, no question. Nice he's an absolute goofball. Okay, so big thing, right, for us is what you'll see first is his feet never come an inch off, more than an inch off the ground. All right. For every step he takes, it's all low to the ground and easy. All right. So just want to kind of talk through some of the pieces that I'm seeing that I'm going to talk to him about later. Okay. So, right. The profile I love. All right. And it's hard to tell from this angle, but it's, he's toe to toe. Right. Which means that he's not in that weird staggered position that we talked about. Right. So there's going to, not going to be a whole bunch of wasted movement. All right. One thing that we try to get them out of, and we talked about not using their, uh, talking about their throwing arm too much, but this is a case where this is something we can tweak, where his back elbow is pointed up, right? So if his back elbow is pointed up, the next thing for the ball to do is drop down. So what you'll see is with that elbow flexed up, is that ball is going to naturally drop down immediately, right? right? And without even seeing it, I can tell that that's what's going to happen, partially because that's his issue a lot of the time, but just biomechanically, there's no other place for the ball to go. So for him, that's going to be a big part of taking the loop out of his delivery is just getting that elbow kind of loose and tied down. So, again, it, he's, he's a big tense guy. He likes to tense all of his muscles, and I can kind of see that he's tensing up in his upper body. All right, so getting him to calm the heck down is, is something that we talk about a lot. So, um, you know, that's, that's a big piece of it. And then the next piece is it's kind of hard to tell without uh, – being able to demonstrate it person to person, but you can see like his back is like flexed, almost like he's doing a row. So what will happen is like his right shoulder is driving well early before his left shoulder is coming through. So what that does is it takes a lot of the tension and the power that's left in your core. All of his power going off to the right, and he's going to have a little bit less pop on the ball because of it. So what we talk about is making sure that your, le- your right side, left side for normal quarterbacks, right-handed quarterbacks, um, is staying locked down and staying closed for as long as you possibly can keep it closed. So that doesn't mean you're fighting against your back arm. It just means that you're staying closed until it has to open. So we want our guys to develop all their power from the back side instead of the front side. What we call this is cranking it. So it means you're cranking it down with your front side elbow, with your front side shoulder. And that means your left side's going to come through, but it's going to come through with a whole lot less power than it would if you used your backside to deliver the ball. So just want to watch this full full speed. All right, pretty clean overall. But what you can see is, I mean, what I'm what I'm talking to you about is the exact same thing that I'm going to be talking to him about later. It's it's all about breaking down the details of it. Okay, now he's going our run pass stuff, all right? So this gives me a chance to talk about our, our run pass, which is just what we call RPOs, run pass. So getting into the mesh, right? Having his eyes up all the time, right? That's an easy, easy tell. We don't, we don't ever get our eyes down into the mesh because you're always going to miss out on your read, right? Feet are staying pretty stagnant, right? Both cleats are in the ground. Guys get into a lot of trouble if they get up on their toes when they're in the mesh because that means the level of the ball is always changing for those running backs, All right? And then when he pops out of it, all right, we call that the pop. 
right? You can see him. He's going mesh away right here, which we do a, a, a good amount of. We can mesh on either side, right? When he pops, you can see his feet are never really coming out of the ground too much, right? And that even might be a little bit too much, right? But what I love is that he's getting his feet back into the ground, right? Because he can get back into that ground zero position, right? Breaks the post and he's taking it up over the top, all right? And then what you can see here, this is a great look at it, that he's really opening up that chest and driving with his front half of his body. So again, he's losing a ton of power because he's doing that, all right? So one thing I'm gonna tell him later is just making sure he keeps that, that right side closed, all right, until that left side comes through. Love his follow through, love that he's on balance. I mean, there's a lot about that to like, but again, like we talked about earlier, I mean, that's that's a hell of a throw and there's a lot about that to like, but we're chasing sustained success. Right. Okay, so I've got one more of him, but but really what I wanna talk about is is all of these things that we talk about, Dylan does a great job of because he, he self-corrects a lot of the time, all right? So what I can trust is the fact that I'm gonna get on with him on, you know, this afternoon and the next time he throws, whenever that may be, he's going to try to self-correct those issues, right? He's going to feel those things with his body. And, and if guys can feel their body and understand that, then they're going to have a lot better chance at chasing that sustained success. Okay. So this is Drew Locke back, uh, back when he was in the senior bowl. All right. And this was something that from an early age for him that we instilled in him was, was self-correcting, right? All of the stuff that he knows that goes on with his throwing mechanics, with his fundamentals, right? It's not always the coach's job to point out, right? You see it all the time when Brady plays too. He's always self-correcting his mechanics, all right? So this fired me up because I pulled this from a Twitter video off of somebody who was showing him, all right? And what I loved was it's so different than our offense. He's under center, faking play action right there, throwing the ball out to the right, missed it. Okay. The beautiful thing is what he does with his body right afterward, right? He's reminding himself that his body was left, his feet were left way down the field when he was trying to throw a corner out, right? So he recognized the issue with his body, issue with his fundamentals, and immediately went to self-correct it. And that fired me up because that's something that we talked about with him constantly, right? And as we're teaching those fundamentals, as we're teaching those techniques, if, if the quarterback doesn't try to self-correct it, then we're always going to be a step behind. So that's uh, that that's something that really fired me up. All right. Um, anything else that you want uh, me to hit on? I've got you know a couple of our indie stuff, a couple other. Uh, if you things. just want to, if you want to go over a couple indie stuff, and then we can kind of wrap yeah. it up, we should be good. And yeah, absolutely. Kind of end it. Yep. Okay, so. I had limited access to the stuff that's on our Exos because we don't have internet on our Exos computer. So this is kind of stuff that, that I had already pulled out from our indie. All right. So this is what we call big bags. All right. And these are the pop-up bags that, that a lot of D linemen use. And, you know, if you know, we, we ordered them for ourselves for quarterbacks, these aren't even ones that D linemen use, hmm. but I know with, you know, with, with high school, with, um, you know, other colleges or other high schools, you might not want to spend the money on a bunch of big pop-up bags for quarterbacks. Right. We, we luckily have a head coach that, that is a quarterback. So we get a little bit of a luck of the draw. And if, but, you, uh, if, if coaches do spend money, all the damn defensive guys take them. So offense no, <laughs> zero. no question. So we, um, you know, we, we use these every day. Um, and if not every day, we use them, you know, at least a few times a week. Um, but, you know, we set it up like there's, there's five of them. And then uh, I'm holding the six for right there uh, in between this guy in the ref jersey and the other one. And it almost looks like the five side of a dice of a dice. Um, so we take our drop and then we're just moving through the bags and we've got somebody stationed at every single one of these bags. That's just making them feel that presence. Okay. All right. One thing that I don't love about him going through this, and this was one of the first times that he went through this, right. It's his feet are really, really active. Like they're just hopping all over the place. He's getting up onto his toes. And when you're spending that much effort into staying still, right, then you're going to have a whole lot less effort into moving when you need to, right? Right. So what this, what this drill is important for us is we teach them don't move until you need to, okay? In the ideal world, you get into the pocket in, in a game and you never, ever move from that pocket, right? Now, that's not real likely. We'd love it, but that's not going to happen all that often. So what we want to teach them is if you have that, take it, right? But only move when you need to. So we make them 
focus on standing still, move when you need to. And then right here, right, I get to move that last bag and then they take off and run. Okay, I'm gonna skip this one real quick. This one, okay. This is what we call base snap, okay. So we get into that ground zero position, right? He does a good job being toe to toe and he's gonna take movements based off of the coach's count, okay? I'm right here calling it, all right? And I'm gonna call a one or a two. So he gets to the back of his drop and I say one and he makes one big movement up and then he stays still, okay? I say two, he makes two. And then when I point, he does that pop like we talked about and run pass and then he delivers the ball, okay? So one thing that I wanna point out with the pop is, right, both feet, it's happened really, really fast, but both feet get back into the ground. Okay, let's see if Dylan gives a little bit better look at it. Okay, there's the one, there's the two movement, and there's the pop. Okay, tough to tell, I didn't pause it at the right time, but gets both feet back into the ground right before he throws the ball. Okay, what that makes, what that does for us is that it lets us, right, if, if, you don't have to throw the ball yet, or if you need to squeeze it for another count to fit that next window, right? Our guys are both in a, or all, our guys are all in a balanced position, right? So that if they do need to sit that second window, or if they do need to scramble after it, they can. Like what you'll see is a lot of guys will have one foot or both feet will be up on their toes, and now they got to drop down to their balls of their feet to be able to do anything. So that's a big piece of of kind of what we do there. Um, see if uh, okay. All right, the last, uh, you know, those those are two drills that are super important to us. And, you know, we've got a couple quick game and, and short things in there. I wish I had more indie tape to show you. But, um, you know, the the last piece that, that I want to show you, if you're good with it, is yep. um, is so just the details of, of playing situational ball, too, and understanding what we do and, and chasing the details of everything. Okay, so what we'll do is you'll see these two – these two files right here, right? One's called why, why fake throw and one called throw it away. I mean, I have a, a basically a dictionary of videos of different situational things that our quarterbacks need to be able to do at a high level for us to, 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 you know, chase that sustained success as an offense and at the quarterback position without even talking about kind of mechanics and all that. So this one's why we fake throw. So anytime we hand the ball off on a run pass stuff, we always want to fake the throw because we want to keep them on their toes, right? So what you'll see is from the back view here, we're just running a little run pass scheme, all right? And is watch number 11 where pops out and he throws, he fakes throws and 11 goes running, right? Completely out of his gap. So this is a great example of why we have to do that all the time, right? Because you never know when it's gonna be hot, really, really, really important for us, right? So. It, one thing that, you know, Mackenzie Milton says all the time and, you know, Coach Milton this past year did a great job for us. He uh, he says, if you're not doing this right, buy a ticket because you're just watching the game. Yep. Right. So he if, if Dylan's ever not faking throwing or isn't coming out, you know, run, run on our C gap reads. He's uh, he's always telling them to buy a ticket. So he does a good job of staying on with that. OK. And the last one is we teach our guys uh, how to throw it away properly. Right. So. This is something that we showed to Dylan at the beginning of the year is when you throw it away, you got to throw it all the way away. And these are just fun clips to watch too. There's Landry Jones back at Oklahoma. Some people remember this clip. He tries to throw the ball away, keeps it in bounds, and the DB jumps up, tips it back in, and it's a pick. Oh, yeah, that's right. So when you throw it away, right, we don't pay for the footballs at least me as a coach or him as a player, our equipment manager might feel different, but we don't pay for the ball. So throw them 10 yards into the stands. I don't care. Yeah. Throw it to your mom right? in the stands. No, no doubt. Right. So that we showed him that clip. We showed him this clip. All right. Same guy, Landry Jones made the same mistake twice trying to throw it away here. And the guy makes an unbelievable vertical jump. Uh, Right, so there's two great clips of when, you, when you're when you throwing it away, throw it all the way away, all right? So we get to the end of the year and we're in a close game with Tulsa. I don't mean to feel Meg Dillon, he already does, but he already watched those clips multiple times of Landry Jones messing it up. He scrambles and he puts it up and this guy that just got drafted in the fourth or fifth round makes a play on the ball and he does the exact same thing. So when he comes to the sideline and he's all upset about it, the first thing that he says is, it's freaking Landry Jones again, <laughs> right? 
because he remembered those clips. But right. He did the exact same thing, right? So again, not all guys will, will get it all. We'll, we'll always be able to teach this. And as soon as we got back off the road, I mean, it was early in the morning when we got back. The first thing I did was put that clip back into this cut up. So, That's awesome. you know, these, these details are, are something that, that we hit with them all the time um, in their mechanics and their fundamentals uh, in the way that they play the game and the way that they view the game everything that we hit is details and structure. And, um, and, and that's been huge for, for Dylan to be able to you know play at a high level early. That was huge for McKenzie. And then obviously big for uh, Drew as well. Back in Missouri. That's just, it's nice to hear that because coaches want to, as soon as they get their quarterback, I don't know, let's say in the mm-hmm. summer and fall, they want to talk scheme and go right in a scheme when like no you know, I'm not starting at ground zero. I, I think that, I think that's brilliant. I think more coaches and especially young kids need to hear that it starts at ground zero and it starts doing the, the little things right. And it's, it's nice no to hear that guys at your level at UCF, you guys are, you're implementing the same stuff. So that's good stuff. Always man. Always. And then, you know, one last thing that I want to talk about with the, with the quarterback position is, um, is something that me and Drew were actually talking about, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago when we were texting back and forth. And one thing that we did for him was we created a schedule of just kind of how to go about your daily life. Um, so, he would he put down on it and he got control of it. He got to decide where he was going to go. You know, he said two nights I was going to sleep at my girlfriend's place and these nights I'm going to sleep at mine and this is what I'm eating for dinner and this is my study time. Mm. And that schedule helped him add structure to his life when he really didn't have it before. And uh, and I was texting back and forth with him and I was like, man, it feels like just yesterday we were making that schedule for you. He said, dude, I still do it. Oh, Tuesdays awesome. was su- he said Tuesdays were sushi Tuesdays. That's and awesome. out out there playing, start starting for the Denver Broncos, and he's you know doing the exact same thing. So that's a huge piece piece of it. And then um, another thing for him was was watching football and not film all the time, but watching documentaries, watching NFL Network, watching you know videos like this, and then just watching it on TV. And right. if guys don't watch football and they don't love it like that and and enjoy that part of it, then you know they're they're missing out on and on a large part of it because. You know, we're not trying to make machines either. We're trying to make people. Has to make, and, them, yeah, you know, make them. No doubt. Right. And so that was a big part for Drew, who was a basketball guy. We, you know, just getting them to fall in love with the game of football. And, and uh, he took it and ran with it. That's, and he's doing, he's doing a hell of a job, man. He's, yeah, he's, he's no a doubt. teacher there in Denver. And you guys Hopefully, have a job with him. I appreciate, well, Coach, I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you taking the time. And um, I know Absolutely, man. coaching fraternity is going to appreciate this one, especially a quarterback guy. So I really yeah, appreciate anytime, you hopping man. on, man. Uh, thank you for having me. All right, man. Take it easy. Good luck this year. Thank you. You too. All right. See you, man. Bye. See you.